Hello and welcome to the 16th episode of the Extreme Sports Performance Podcast. My name is Ryan Blake, I'm the founder and CEO of Extreme Sports Performance. In this episode, I'm speaking to Clive Brewer. Clive is the Assistant Director of High Performance Programs for the Toronto Blue Jays. I ask him the questions I ask all my guests. Who he is, what he does, where has he come from and what has he done along the way? What are the key moments from his career so far? What are his top areas of interest? What are the most valuable things he's learnt? Who are his top influencers? What are his top resources for information? What are his top sports performance exercises and or drills? What are his top pieces of advice in life, exercise and or sport? And finally, where can people find him? We freestyle a little bit in between questions and towards the end. Really interesting episode, this one. I hope you enjoy listening to it. Here we go. Clive, thanks for joining us today on the Extreme Sports Performance Podcast. Please, can you start by telling the listeners who you are and what you do? So I'm the Assistant Director for High Performance Programs uh, with the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, so... Largely, that means working with a great team of uh, professionals um, across the strength and conditioning, the medical, mental performance, nutrition, and learning fields um, to pull together any aspect of performance that's not directly related to baseball. It's directly related to baseball because ultimately we want to make better baseball players, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's those areas that aren't on the field coaching um, with the, the Blue Jays organization. Fantastic. And... Where have you come from and what have you done along the way to kind of get to where you are now? Prior to this, I did some, some consulting for a number of organisations, um, which I discovered I didn't really like because I wanted to be, I, I like growing a story, I like being part of something um, and, and developing something uh, on a daily basis. Um, prior to that, I was with uh, Witness Vikings um, as their head of S&C, great three years with that club. And uh, didn't renew my contract with them to take up an opportunity in the states that didn't didn't quite materialise, which was a which was a really good learning curve for me. And then before that, I had a number of like national lead roles. So I was the national lead for human performance with uh, England Rugby League. And before that, I was the national lead for athlete development with Sports Scotland. So looking at all the uh, the athlete development progressions um, and getting athletes from you know trying to link high school up to you know, up to the Olympic Games or, you know, the international sport arena. So I've had a number of various roles in that as well as being a hands-on coach along the way. Fantastic. So you've had, obviously, a very varied experience over quite a long time frame. I know it's hard to probably choose the key moments, but if you had to, off the top of your head, pick key moments from your career so far, what would they be? Yeah, no, it's, you're, you're right, that is hard. I mean, I think that, that largely they, they, those key moments come when you have you meet someone or you know or your your thought process goes in a different direction or you have a particularly great learning experience that that makes you reflect on on what you're doing and where you're going or things that create an opportunity so for example um you know i i can say one of the defining moments in my career was probably nothing to do with me but it was more about the you know how a group of people came together to form the uk strength and conditioning association and i mean i was involved in that development process and involved in the board for 12 years but i think that you know really helped to solidify the profession within the uk and set the quality standards so even if it's not a defined moment i think that was that was one thing that i think is is important for my career today Others are usually around like meeting key people. So, uh, 2003, I went to a strength and conditioning event up in Largs in Scotland um, that was organised by Dougie Bryce and Linda Lowe. I met two key people there. One was Linda Lowe, who I went on to marry. Um, so, probably important to recognise that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but more, you know, it was also the first time I came across uh, Mike Stone. So, uh, you know, Mike and I sat down and I, and I, at the time I was working with a, some of the British bobsleigh athletes and I said to Mike, look, I've got this plan to get them to the, to the Olympics, but I'm not really sure it's the best plan. Would you mind just sitting down with me and spending some time going through it? And 
you know, Mike was really gracious with his time, and, and, and that taught me something. That taught me a lesson as well about you know always trying to give time to help out other people and help understand their problems. And you know, and so we got you know we, we pulled out my quadrennial plan and the two year plan and the year plan, and we got down to talking about sessions and concepts and training. And it was one of the best mornings I've I've ever had. And on the back of that, he invited me out to the U.S. Olympic Center where he was at the time. So you know, and that started a that started a friendship that's really, you know, gone on, but and a working relationship that, that that still carries on today now. And so, and I can say the similar thing about the first time I met Lauren Seagrave, and you know, he and I got into discussion about what's more important: uh, is it just getting people to move fast, or is it about how they move? Um, probably prior to meeting him, I was more about let's just get people moving fast because we can't make that much difference. And then after spending time with him. I managed to reevaluate my coaching philosophy around that completely and think that, which actually then tied in with what I knew medically and physio, physio mechanically, if that makes sense. Uh-huh. And yeah. that really, really enabled me to, to solidify my philosophy. Whereas before, and I was kind of, my knowledge said one thing, I was probably doing something different and, and not doing very well at it. Actually, then being able to structure, bring the two together and, and actually formulate my, my coaching progressions really well. So I think they're kind of, examples of key defy and I, you know and I've had many of them that have gone through but they've, they've usually been around where is where have you met someone where has someone impacted you or where has someone really made you think about how you do things and, and is there a is there a better way of doing them you know sure now that's really interesting Clive and I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you that meeting other people having conversations with other, other like-minded professionals does uh, change the way you look at things um, and often often for the better so those times spent are, are times that I think are very valuable um, so just just kind of coming coming back to baseball um, could you just give us an overview of what your kind of year looks like so what the key phases of the season are yeah sure um, so from in, in, in th- there's probably for me there's there's four distinct phases um of my year, which relates to the baseball calendar as such. So, uh, the first one is the first one is spring training. So, uh, my role within spring training is largely about putting together. Um, so, I work with the baseball coaches to put together a scheduling program, which enables you know things things that we would we would understand as typical, which are you know uh, periods of you know heavy days lighter days or lighter on feet days um you know so, so there's a fluctuation in physical workload within it but also there's a fluctuation in intensity of of the work that we do and that uh, you know again i'm blessed to work with people who are open-minded enough to try that because baseball's not traditionally been that it's every day has been the same schedule all the time yeah um so so spring training is a pretty intense period uh, we actually start spring training earlier than most teams the union the players union dictates a day when it officially can start but which is around about february the 11th or 12th um we actually have probably 50 players in at the complex here in florida for probably for mid-january through um and they're targeting on individual work or individual individual development plans um then spring training starts and spring trainings like we have somewhere close to 200 players here um they split into uh five teams major league play fixtures minor league play fixtures then we have a development squad that we can pull players from plus a rehab squad um as well who are are here working on on getting better rehab wise so spring training goes on till in fact it just finished uh last week uh the major league season then starts sort of the last week of March the minor league season actually starts today in terms of a playing season so now we have 90 players here at the complex who will do what we call extended spring training Mm -hmm. and these are guys who said typically their first year of full-time professional baseball but they're not yet good enough to go and break with a team Uh, we've got four teams who are in or their home their home base is Buffalo in New York State um, Manchester New Hampshire one in Dunedin in Florida, so just down the road, and then another one in Lansing, Michigan. And they'll play in their regional leagues, and each one of those has got 25 players. And then we've got the Major League squad with 25 players as well. So 125 players out remotely. So for, 
for the next period of time for me is now about how do I how can I monitor the data that's coming in from those guys and how can I best help the staff and empower the staff to manage their programs effectively with the players that they have in front of them you know so what what tools do they need what help do they need what advice do they need um, to best do their job because you know obviously we, we can't manage players centrally so it's about you know it's that empowerment model mm-hmm. you know we want to collaborate and empower um, those guys to do the best they can to develop the players in front of them um, and become the best coaches uh, that they can be whether that's medically or from a strength and conditioning perspective or nutritionally and then also starting to ramp up now towards uh, the draft so we have the draft in June so in high performance we play a role in, in helping the draft process so how can we how can we best select the next generation of Blue Jays coming in so there's a big focus on working with our scouting department around that and then after the draft it's uh, for a lot of people then we have another three teams that go out on the road believe it or not and so that'll give us seven seven teams in total and my and my real focus then at that point in time is as they play a short season all the other teams work towards hopefully achieving playoff baseball my focus is then on how can we plan for the end of season and off season periods and how can we develop the system to make sure that next year we're better if that makes sense sure no, that's, that's fascinating you know it's a, a huge operation and um, I didn't realise that your numbers were were quite that high. So it's uh, it's uh, the long the wonder you're busy. Uh, it sounds like you've got a lot in your plate. Um, and it, it, you know it just sound, it sounds very a very very complex to make sure it all works. It is, um, and it, and again, it's a great team effort. It's, you know I'm you know I'm lucky enough to be a cog in the wheel, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, from that perspective, so it's it's how do we get you know everyone working together to to really deliver that so that you know having a real focus on on high quality stuff uh to empower that is is important but you know interestingly i still want to try and you know one of my biggest things every day is where can i get some coaching and you know i'm I'm still that guy that wants to be on the floor working with athletes so whether that's helping support rehab or you know if i if i travel out to affiliates how can i you know deliver a a hands-on staff development session or whatever because that's that's still part of it's a minor part of my job now, but it's still my first love, you know. Sure. So, bearing in mind what we've just discussed, what, what would you say your your top three areas of interest are at the moment that help you do all that to look, you know, maximise the the efficiency or the the, the positive results that occur? <laughs> I, I I guess that's never changed really from where whichever context you work in. I mean, there's there's. Uh, I mean, if you ask me what I'm interested in, it's still, you know, it's still the stuff on the floor. It's still how can we get better technique development? How can we get? But that's not really where my job driver is at the minute, you know. So, um, if you're looking at how do we deliver the job, the first, the first question we've got to understand is what does success look like, you know? So, for example, go back to the work we did at rugby. We knew that the basic, the more, the more meters per minute we could achieve in offence and the higher quality of play that we can achieve in defence, the greater our chances of winning. It was such a physical arm wrestle that, the, you know, we could directly correlate success in terms of win-loss to some physical attributes. So then once we understood what success was, how do you then drive the, the training programme to achieve those outcomes? You know, so if we want more metres per minute, what do the players need to be able to do to achieve that? And then what are the structures that we put in place underneath that? Sure. And looking at building the system which um, where we can understand what are our what are our risks to that. Um, so the risk to any the risk to any player achieving the biggest risk is is, is injury, right? Um, and I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, when they're developing athletes, the first thing they've got to do is to you know, avoid injury or reduce injury or whatever. I'm not sure that's the emphasis we want to put on things because ultimately our aim is to make players better players, right? So I think that's one of the areas where it's strength and conditioning as a profession doesn't doesn't often do itself favours. You know, in terms of you know, when you say to people, "How do you know you're making a player better?" They'll talk about you know, they've improved a certain test or they've the athlete can squat more or whatever. But fundamentally, it's like how have we made these guys better players or better athletes, yeah. depending on the context. So. But, but first and foremost around that is making sure the player is available. And I'm not a big guy who, 
wants to sit down and say, look, you need to do performance training, then you need to do injury prevention training. I don't, you know, the the statistics tend to demonstrate that as long as a guy is strong in the right way, stronger athletes will perform better. They'll be more robust. They'll get injured less. You know. Mm-hmm. So when I say strong in the right way, you know, baseball players are never going to make good powerlifters, and, and nor should they. Um, and and similarly, powerlifters are never going to make good baseball players. So it's more about how can we get, I'm going to steal a phrase from Cirque du Soleil, but how can we get durability by design, i.e. we improve, we, 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 we tailor individual programs towards performance improvement, but at the same time we address areas of functional risk within those individuals, and that that keeps them available more often you know sure. I think that's another that's that's another area of interest of mine is is and, and also just in terms of driving the profession forward I think there's a lot of guys that, that look at we need to plan it we need to manage players workload in order to you know how, how can we keep them fresh all the time or how can we you know and often that's about how can we stop them working how can we reduce their work volume and you know um Tony Strudwick says this far better than me, but you know when he was at United with Ferguson, and Ferguson kind of said, "No, your job is to get them available for me to coach. You know, our job is to make them as available as often as they can be, so that we can then, you know, we can do things with them." And I think that's, you know, that's one of the key areas of focus as well of mine. I think ultimately maximising opportunity for them to to play more baseball or, or have have more players available to to select to play baseball is 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 the ultimate goal. We play 162. You know, if you're a major league player, you play 162 games in 180 days. You know, wow. so we, you know, the opportunity is there to play every day. It's more about for us is saying like, you know, okay, what does an everyday player really mean? It's not going to be 162 games a year. You know, we are going to need to plan in rest breaks on that. But more importantly, is saying to the coach, look, if we we can identify that this guy is trending towards somewhere where he's going to need a, you know, he's going to need a break whether that's a day or two days, you know, and when when would you best like that break to be? Because if otherwise we think that he's trending towards an injury risk and, and therefore that decision is taken out of your hands, you know? Sure. And that's not an exact science yet, but it's pulling together a number of, let's call them functional risk indicators around each individual player to enable the staff to make that decision and have that communication with the coach. So what is the player's workload? How is he responding to that workload? And, you know, therefore, and what's his planned workload coming up and what do we need to do to adjust that in order to keep him as available for the coach? And I think you use the key word there is about is, is about the opportunity, you know. How do we best manage that opportunity and accept the fact in, in our younger players, we need to actually increase their, you know, we need to spend time focusing on increasing their capacity so that they build up, they build up a work capacity in our older players it's more about how do we manage that work to enable them to perform every night you know as they get towards the major leagues and in the major leagues they're an everyday player so you know how do we give them the best chance to shine when they're on the field I mean I find that really interesting Clive thanks for sharing that and you you know you previously alluded to the the, in terms of numbers the amount of players you have to look after in the amount of different places and the amount of games they're expected to play What, what would you say that the most valuable things that you've learned are from being involved in the sport with regard to that? Firstly, I think, I mean, this is, this will go to any coach working in any sport, but remember you're here to, you know, you, you've got to be humble and be subservient to the athlete. You know, you are the expert, but it's really about how do you best deliver the, what's, what's, what, what they need. You know, so it's all about putting the athlete at the centre of your, the centre of your delivery, you know, and so therefore, around that is making sure that you you know you have you know high quality staff who are who are really good at doing that so building relationships with staff and then having the staff build the relationships with the players is is massively important to that process you know so it's one of the things that you know is important in, in how I go about things for example for example is you know rather than me taking a coaching session with players that I may want to do because it's a fun thing it's like I've got to let the coaches who are going to be working with those players develop their relationship and take that coaching and then how can I help them with that from a technical perspective or or whatever but there's there's no substitute for um, putting the player at the centre of, of, of everything you do 
building high quality relationships with the player or the staff who are going to be developing uh, delivering to that player you know I think that's that is really important so we put we put staff um, having high quality staff there is, is you know essential to our to our delivery priorities I completely agree I mean obviously with with numbers like that high um, and, and with a schedule that hectic uh, it's, it's almost chaos management I suppose in a way isn't it and uh, and, and try and just trying to maximise how effective the team are working together and as you said like probably trying to focus on the needs to do's rather than the nice to do's um, for yourself it's, 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 it's an exercise I mean like as, as strength and conditioning coaches, we're supposed to be good at periodization, right? So it's yeah. periodization is just about how do you how do you prioritize and how do you put the right emphasis on something? It's emphasis loading, you know. So, and, I, and I think it's no different from it's no different from how we work, you know. In coaching, it's no different from how I do now. It's like where where can we get the most priority from the system, you know? Sure. And I've got I've got a great boss who's really good at helping me with that, and I've got a um, you know, I've got great colleagues who help us with that, and you know, um, and the other thing is, it's it's not being afraid to make mistakes uh, for the right reasons, you know. Sure. And to listen to the feedback when you do, and act upon that feedback. Sure. So this this alludes really nicely into kind of one of the next questions. Who who would you say, not necessarily just in baseball, but over your career? have been your biggest influences and kind of helped guide you the most? I mean, I know you alluded to, to Mike being one of those at the start of our chat, but are there yeah. any others that you feel have helped shape your practice or the way of thinking and where you coach? Yeah, I mean, so having... I think the first thing is, is is going into... It's important that you seek feedback as a coach, right? Don't wait for it to come, but seek it and be, be proactive in that. And so... One of the things, uh, and again, not just because my wife, but but I mean Linda, Linda's expertise. Um, she was the national lead for coach development for Scotland, but has worked across a large number of sports. And and actually having someone who is fantastic at analysing how you coach, and, and having and you know working with her in a number of different situations where she can come back and say, look, you know, you you can get more effective if you ask this question or. If you position yourself here, you'll get more visibility of that. Or if you structure the practice in this way, you'll achieve, you know, this outcome with the with the audience you're working with. So, she's she's been a big um, a big influence in in how I work with you know with both athletes, but also you know in and around other staff. So, um, you know, Mike, obviously from a from a sports science perspective, and from you know from understanding the the underpinning physio mechanics of strengthening conditioning the you know Lauren we talked about again in terms of you know the, the, the speed and movement sorts of areas of areas of work but you know also there's there's been other key people you know along the way like you know the, the, the head of strength and conditioning uh, here was absolutely fundamental for me Donovan Santos is a great guy he's been in the Blue Jays for, for 16 years he was absolutely fundamental for me in terms of bridging the gap between you know the cultural divide between you know how we are and do things in the UK versus you know setting the system up for success when I came in here into the US you know what are what are people's expectations and how do we do things and, and culturally they're very different you know um, and I don't think you know I don't think I'd still be here if it wasn't for the help and support that he gave me uh, in terms of in terms of that process and you know, similarly, my boss, the uh, the performance director here, Angus Mugford, he's a psychologist by trade, but he's 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 been fantastic for me in terms of just again looking at how can we create psychological security whilst pushing to get better. You know, how do you take people with you as opposed to you know having a concept that may be a great concept, but if the people don't want to deliver it, then it isn't gonna, it isn't going to fly. You know, so working with him to create those sorts of ideas and bringing those ideas to fruition have all been been really important for me fantastic thank thanks again for sharing that it's always nice for people to hear about other you know very well sought after and respected professionals in the field that they may not have heard of before so if if you were faced with a problem 
um, or needed information about something that you, you, you to help solve a problem that you didn't know the answer to. Well, what would be your kind of top places to go to, your top resources to try and help with that? I mean, I think it comes back to it comes back to what is our where does that problem exist? You know, if it's a, if it's a baseball problem, for example, I mean, I have a very naive perspective to. I mean, I work I work around people every day who have been, you know, they, the game has been their life, um, and they've been very tolerant with me in terms of you know me asking the, the, the dumb questions. But also, it's it's worked really well because you can come in with a completely outside perspective and say, why do you, why do we do this? And if the answer is well, because we've always done it, then actually, is that the best reason for doing it? You know. So, the other the other thing I, I think that's been key for me is the recognition that the biggest data set that we have around us is our coaches' knowledge and experience. Yeah. So, whether that's whether that's baseball, in which case I've got a great number of people who I can go to. But even if it was something else, I'd, I'd tend to say, okay, look who has got the best experience and the best knowledge in this field that I can, I can, you know, live and, and learn from, you know, is it, and, and again, and again, everyone's got their network, you know, I mean, I've, I've been lucky, developed a great network here, whether that's, you know, Duncan French, at, you know, at UFC or whether that's Mike Favor at University of, of Michigan, you know, he was at the USOC and I've done some projects with him. So is it you know? Do you go to those resources, or do you go completely outside your comfort zone and go? You know, I don't know this, but you're a world expert in it, and I really want to reach out and say, you know, I I need to find out a bit more about sleep for this player. So, you know, Dr. Sherry Ma, you're a world expert in it. Can you help? You know. And I think when I was when I was young and dumb and stupid, I used to think about reaching out as a as a sign of weakness. You know, it was it was I was insecure. Whereas now I'm. I'm just more experienced, but equally as dumb. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you realise that if you're putting the athlete's needs at the centre of it, and also, you know, like, shit, if I if I if, if I can get someone else to deliver this who knows form far more far more than I do, then I'm going to get educated in the process. You know, so it's, it's actually just being being vulnerable enough to reach out and say, look, I, I really need help with this. And you know, I'd encourage anyone to take that approach because once you once you do that, it it opens up far more for you. So for sure, I have a go-to network of people that I go to for specific issues. But equally, I'm not afraid just to reach out and say, I've seen you do some really cool stuff in this field. I want to know more, you know, how can we help each other? Awesome. I always love asking that question because I always I always steal the golden nuggets I get as answers from people. <laughs> so again, thanks for sharing that, Clive. So this next question is one that I find people find probably the hardest one to answer, probably because it, it, it's such a varied and, and wide open question. But if we're looking at it from a purely from a baseball perspective, what would you say the top three sports performance exercises or and or drills are that you would you would see more often within a baseball season that the players actually perform? Probably the best way to answer that question is to is to kind of reverse engineer it a bit and, and you know give you an example about like some of the big. So the big debates over that occur all the time is like you know, um, baseball players shouldn't do Olympic lifting. You know, I'm like, well, scrap that answer because there's a time when anyone should do Olympic lifting, but there's also a time when a lot of people shouldn't. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So I don't like bringing it down to to those sorts of those sorts of discussions and arguments. You know, it's more about for us where do we manage workload. So. You know, for example, we split our pitchers, the starting pitchers on a five-day routine is they're the easiest guys to manage. Um, so they, they perform once every five days. And, in, you know, in the intermediate phases of that, they do, you know, they'll do a total body lift. Um, they'll do what we call it. So the first thing they do is what we call a tactical lift, which is soon after their game, they're still not completely recovered. It's more about addressing in the, in the weight room their areas of, of need in terms of their functional risk and unwinding them from the game. They'll, they'll then do a total body lift, um, which is where we really get after it for them in terms of their strength development. And then the day before they, they throw, they, we do a neural lift, which is more about, you know, you know, an activator for the neuromuscular system, you know, in, in terms of that. So, and they're more strength driven, they're more, you know, you're trying to get, you know, you, you know, you worked in cricket, you understand about 100 mile an hour deliveries. Well, yeah. you know, 
the, the starting pitchers are trying to get a hundred mile an hour delivery from one st- one stride, you know. So it's about how do you turn linear motion into rotational motion, and how do you take a ground? Yeah, you know, pitching is a ground up action, and transfer those ground reaction forces through the entire posture. So we look more about you know the the, the, the guys tend not to squat; they tend to deadlift more because of load through the spine and how they manage that. And also the you know the ability to recover, but same same with position players, you know they're playing all the time and every day. And the squat takes a lot out of someone, you know, uh, as an exercise as a you know as a high as a high load barbell back squat, you know. Whereas a trap bar deadlift might not. So we use squat emotions tend to be done through other other forms like kettlebells, which is more about form and posture um, and power as opposed to load. And strength if that makes sense sure sure um so i'm kind of waffling and rambling here and i'm definitely avoiding the question for which i'm <laughs> don't worry everyone um, does <laughs> yeah the, like the, the key for me is it goes back to what does this athlete need you sure, know? sure so when i think back to some of the things that i've learned from here like some movements like um the turkeys get up i've used them in the past with rugby players and i realized how badly i really coached that because the rugby player's approach was let's just pick something heavy and then you know power through the turkeys get up so I end up from going from the floor into a standing up position whereas with our players here because mobility and um, hip shoulder separation in the throwing action is so important for us but also in the hitting action there are there are positions within the turkeys get up that are absolutely key for our players to, to nail you know and it's also it's a core exercise for us in terms of not just posture control but also arm, arm control you know, so stages of things in the arm bar and stuff like that is really good for activation of those, um, uh, you know, the, the muscles around the shoulder, the humeral uh, attractors that, that hold the arm in place and hold the shoulder in place during the throwing action. So that's that's a really, that's a key exercise that I think is in pretty much most of the players' programs, but we're able to say, you do it to this point, you do it to this point, you do it to this point. And, uh, you know, that's, baseball's taught me the importance of that um, whereas before, and I can say I just did a bad job of coaching it. I think where I think we can get a lot better in baseball is around the the integration of plyometrics for players, and also the you know the speed development work because ultimately we're a game that where success involves you know how many multiples of you know of, of thirty yards can you actually get in to, to to score a run? So we can do a lot better with you know much more speed mechanics and speed execution speed technique so we're working to look at where can we integrate that into our daily program and I think that's going to be a key difference maker and obviously the link between strength and speed is the is the, is the plyometrics you know not just from a, a power output perspective but but I love using plyometrics in terms of sequencing movement and you know if you're looking at generating impulse and things um, and coordinating lower body to upper body action I think they're key exercises that we, you know, that we can integrate as well. So, you know, I, I think that's that's the three buckets of areas. But I think in those three buckets comes every other exercise that you can ever dream of. And, of course, yeah, they yeah. know about. So but that, that's really insightful, Clive. Think again. Thanks for sharing that. I, I mean, it fascinates me because obviously I speak to a lot of people on the show, but who work in in different sports, and everyone's always got a different approach. And um, the, the answers are never the same, so it's yeah, it's it's really nice to to kind of get your insight on that. Just on that though, I mean, just sorry to interrupt you. That's all right, no problem. But it's but it is one of those things that a lot of people have a misperception about. Like I, I spoke to someone the other day, and you know they were saying, "Geez, you know, we thought you just taught Olympic lifts to everybody," and I said, "Well, why did you think that?" You know, and they said, "Well, because on the you know the UKSCA workshops where we came across you." You know, you talked about the importance of Olympic lifts. And I said, so you came on a workshop for Olympic lifting and wondered why I talked about the importance of Olympic lifts. <laughs> you know, I said, that was the outcome of the workshop. It, it didn't, doesn't, you know, it doesn't reflect, you know. So then we had a discussion about, well, did all your rugby players do Olympic lifting? And, and no, those that, those that would benefit from a derivative of it did it. And those that wouldn't, didn't, you know. Yeah. Um, it just comes back to what is identifying what is your athlete need, and then what is the best tool to address that need. Of course, in the in the short, medium, and long term. Yeah, 
and I completely relate to that because obviously at the moment I spend a lot of time working with multi-sport youth athletes and again it's it's a big numbers game we've got a lot of athletes to look after in a lot of different sports and they're all even though they're, they're the same age they might be different they're all different shapes and sizes and it's as you you know as you've rightly said it's not it's not a, a one size fits all approach you, you've got to you've got to put down what's best for that person um, at that time and um, you know that that will always change it will never be the same and you can't you can't pigeonhole groups of people to groups of exercises it just doesn't work that way does it yeah absolutely the, the follow up question I was going to ask Clive was how, how important is kind of energy system development or I suppose inverted commas conditioning to baseball and how much of that would you do throughout the year with our starting pitches is probably our highest priority for that because they have they have a big workload to get through you know I mean by by the middle of the season, they're they're going to be delivering you know 120 pitches, yeah. um, and you know so that's a big singular repeat high intensity workload for them to do. You know, uh, I mean every pitch, you know every fastball for example is a is a maximal exercise. Um, so we probably do a lot more conditioning based work with the starting pitches than anybody. Um, Relief pitchers, it's a little bit different because, I mean, some of those guys, their job is to come in and get one player out. You know, they may come in and throw three pitches as a, as a really extreme example, you know. Yeah. But they may do that three nights running. So that comes down much more down to the individual level. And then with the, the position players, we actually don't do an awful lot because the game tends to give them the conditioning they need if they're playing every day. Sure, you sure. Know? So the, our approach with them really is about we look to monitor their we look to monitor their intensity and their, their game the game intensity and the game volume metrics and then based upon that if their volume is falling off or or we think the volume has become an issue we'll do more con- volume based conditioning with them you know which I, and by which I mean you know repeat intervals and then if they're if you know if their accelerations are dropping off, we'll probably do conditioning through more agility, direction change, acceleration intervals. You know, but actual energy system development is not highly important for game outcome, as it might be in you know soccer or rugby, for example. Sure, sure. Okay, well, no, that's really interesting. Uh, so that was the question that I I kind of starred myself because that that's um, that was one I really wanted to know the answer to. I'm not sure I've got the answer to it, but that's kind of how we. Do it. Yeah, well, no, it's really insightful, and to, it's just, I just, I think it's just going to give the listeners a little bit more uh, over, over an overview of how to how to approach um, managing base, a baseball player, um, and how it might differ to, for instance, to a cricket player or a tennis player who, you know, similar similar concept or similar biomechanics, um, but again, very different approaches. So. Last couple of questions, as I, I promised, I would wouldn't keep you for more than um, for, than an hour. What would you say your top pieces of advice would be in in life, exercise, and or sport to any kind of practitioners, graduates uh, looking to get into the field or are new to the field? Any of your any words of wisdom for them? I think the, the first thing is you got to be curious. You know, you've always you've always got to be asking questions, and and you've also got to be open minded open minded enough to listen to answers. You know, so that the more when, when I look, but you know, it, it's, it's interesting when I've you know worked with people over a number of years or trapped their career or. Or what have you is that there are there are some people who are really really good at simulating learning and going yeah I can learn from this I can learn you know I want to learn everything to start with but then you have to start setting out your ideas and saying okay this is the direction of travel and I'm gonna yeah I can accept that and reject that and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so they begin to shape their own philosophy um, you know there's a, there's a view that level one coaches copy level two coaches uh, adapt and level three coaches invent for example, you sure. know, but, but to invent, you've got to be inventing based upon some form of experiential knowledge. Um, so 
so one is, is be curious, ask ask lots of questions, don't accept anything, but make sure you do listen to the answers and listen to what people give you, because that's that's where true learning occurs. Um, I think make sure that you are open minded, and if if someone is giving you some advice, um, you know you don't always have to listen to it, but you really should pay attention to it. If that makes sense, yeah, and, and determine, yeah. Um, so, so it, determine is it good advice? Is it going to make me better? Um, you know, work from there. And three is um, in terms of your own learning as a coach. There's, you know, if you want to be a better coach, the first thing you can do is coach. And the more coaching you do, the better the coach that you are going to be. You know, and so there is no. You can do all the book learning you want to. You can do all the questions and discussions and listen to all the podcasts you want to but the best learning that you're ever going to have is by doing um, and by being a coach and and getting that experience and so the the next piece of advice I'll also say is don't don't narrow yourself to coaching one particular group of people you know I think that every every coach in their learning should coach um, should try and coach someone with learning disabilities and should try and coach someone with physical disability um, because those, those those guys face problems every day. They learn how to solve problems every day. And it will really challenge your ability to, cut to a coach to say, can I create the right environment and the right program that will enable these guys to solve problems, you know, and move forward. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's they're, they're really good ways of, of learning. And, you know, try working with kids, et cetera, et cetera, so that you, you, you learn what works in different situations and, you know, you, it gives you a better background experience to to adapt to. Um, I think they're my they're my big three tips. I, I guess. Bro, um, No, much appreciated. And, and I, you know, again, I, I completely agree. I've, I've, I've personally worked with many different groups of athletes at many different kind of levels of ability, of many different ages, and in many different sports. And I still find I learn something new every day. Um, it's, 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 there's never, it's never a point in time where I think, yep, I think I know it all now because I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> I think when you get to that point, you, you need to, you need to have a long, hard look in the mirror because you might be doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think you're right. And that's where, you know, some of my biggest learnings are is where people have come up to me and said, look, you know, and I say even whether it's, whether it's adapting to cultural change or whatever, but it's people coming back and saying, Clive, listen, I really think that I've watched you in this situation and I'm, you know, I'm not sure what you were trying to achieve, but by doing that, this is what the outcome was, and it probably wasn't the best outcome. And you're going, oh Jesus! Now you point that out. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm. You know, they're really good having people having people observe your coaching who are able to give you critical feedback, or else even, you know, we do a lot here with the coaches where we video them and we put a microphone on them and we give them a chance to review it you know, with a more experienced coach and, and, and ask questions about what were you trying to achieve here, really like what you did here, but what about this situation? What were you, what were you focused on? What were you trying to achieve? Could, you know, what do you think there's a better way of doing it? And, and those opportunities are just priceless. Awesome. Yeah, that's brilliant. I've, I've, I've never heard of, um, of coaches doing things um, in more reflective learning or reflective practice, I suppose, in, in such detail. Um, but I can only imagine that's very helpful. And um, I think when you watch yourself back, like when I watch, listen to my voice or listen to myself speak or watch videos of myself back, I sometimes think, God, that looks like a completely different or sounds like a completely different person to what I actually thought it would. So yeah. it, such a useful tool. Brilliant. So Clive, I just wanted to wrap up just, just by saying, um, you know, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, if, if people wanted to get in touch with you um, to maybe ask some follow-up questions, what would be the best way of them doing that? My email is, is pretty simple. It's clive.brewer at bluejays.com. I'm, at, I'm on Facebook. I'm on uh, Twitter, although I've got no idea what my Twitter account thing is. I'll, um, I'll find it and put it in the show notes. Don't worry. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and LinkedIn and stuff. I mean, I'm not, like I say, I don't, I'm not a big, I'm not a big social media guy, um, you know, but there's, there's a number of ways that, that, that people can, you know, can reach out and I'll, I'll, I promise I'll get back to them. I don't promise I'll get back to them immediately, but I certainly, um, I certainly will respect the fact they've made some effort to try and get in touch and, uh, and come back and help if I can, you know? 
So, but uh, like I say, I'm not I'm not one of those guys that's on social media all the time or trying to put these theories out or, or whatever. Brilliant. So, I know you're always busy, but what 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 the next uh, what's the next month looking like for you over there? Ooh, that's a good good question. So, our draft preparation starts next week, um, and then I'm on the road a bit for a bit visiting some of our affiliates. So, I'm going to be up in. Um, so we've got draft meetings. Uh, there's some, you know, some time in the major league, some time in in Lansing in Michigan, and then some time back here, just trying to sit down and map out, um, you know, some more of the let's call it our system areas of development that we need to work on. So, um, yeah, a lot of t- a lot of time traveling, but uh, but also you know time here at the rehab facility, um, just trying to help with you know help make our system more robust and, and better I guess awesome well best of luck with everything best of luck for the season and um, again thanks for your time just just stay on the line on it whilst I stop the recording but um, yeah much appreciated for your insights and um, thanks very much no it's been awesome thanks Ryan I appreciate it good luck to everyone thanks for listening to the 16th episode we hope you enjoyed the show Please leave us a rating and or review on whichever platform you're listening on. Please check out our website www.extremesportsperformance.com On our media page we have weekly blogs that include Thought of the Week, Exercise of the Week, Recipe of the Week and Training Song of the Week. Each month's collection gets compiled into our monthly newsletter along with company service and store updates. You can sign up for free to receive this via our subscribe page. Our online store consists of training programs, online and in-person coaching, nutrition plans, toolbox and interactive training systems. Please follow us on our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Links to these can be found at the bottom of every page on our website or via any search engine. That's all for now. Until next time, take care.